Hi, welcome to Pro Football Now as we are heading into the divisional round of the NFL postseason. I'm Amy Campbell, joined by our insiders from the MMQB. Albert Breer joins me in studio as always. And today we've got Jonathan Jones coming to us via Skype. We're going to preview the four divisional round matchups on tap for the weekend. Albert, some teams we expected to yep. be here, some teams we didn't expect to be here. We'll start with the Falcons at the Eagles, the number six seed at the number one seed. Falcons looking like that hangover is gone. They're playing yeah. better than we've seen them play play in a long time. What do you expect this matchup to look like at Philadelphia? Well, I think the key is going to be what the Falcons do defensively um, against the Eagles offense with Nick Foles pulling the trigger. One of the things that's hidden, we've talked a lot about Steve Sarkeesian and the fall off from Kyle Shanahan and is Matt Ryan right? All of that over the course of the entire year. Quietly, that defense behind the new coordinator there, Marquand Manuel, has gotten a lot better. And I can remember the, I can remember during the Super Bowl last year, you looked out on that field, you saw how fast they look and how young they were, 23, 24, 25-year-olds everywhere. And they get Desmond, Desmond Trufant back at corner, and some of their younger guys have grown up a little bit, Devondre Campbell and Deion Jones and the guys in the D-line. And really, this may not be quite as good a team as it was last year going into the playoffs, but it feels like a much more balanced team. And so I think that part of it's interesting. I think it's a big reason why they were able to beat the Rams on Saturday night. I thought Matt Ryan played as well as he has all year. And so this is a dangerous team, not just for this weekend, going up against a team that's without its MVP candidate in Philadelphia, but also I think a dangerous team maybe to go all the way to the Super Bowl in Minnesota, which I don't think a lot of people would have guessed about a month ago. Yeah, the Falcons looking like they've been yeah. there before. Jonathan, what do you think of this one? Yeah, I totally agree, and that's why I picked the Falcons against the Rams because they had been there before, because they had playoff experience on their side, and I think that absolutely showed it uh, last week, last weekend from really the start of the game all the way through. They look like the more experienced team. Listen, this happened last year with the Falcons. They're an NFC South team that not a lot of people were paying a lot of attention to. That's a division that, while very good this season, really has not had a lot of attention paid to it nationally, I think. And so people saw the Falcons when they played the Patriots uh, on that primetime game, and it looked like Steve Sarkeesian had no idea how to call plays, that the Falcons were absolutely done. There was a point there in the middle of the season where they were 500. But when you really dug into some of those games, the Buffalo loss, the Miami loss, those were really tight games that they, that they shouldn't have lost, but they lost games like that last season. And then they went on that tear. And then you look at this at how they finished the season, wins against Seattle. You know, they had some uh, a win against Carolina where they had to win that game, win and end. Uh, you look at the loss that they had, Minnesota and New Orleans, both two teams that could very well be in the Super Bowl, and those are their most recent losses. And so this is a team, I believe that they would beat the Rams. I believe that they'll beat the Eagles. To, to Albert's point, of course, this is, all, this is going to be about Atlanta's young defense. Keanu Neal and Deion Jones, the kind of hits that they usually deliver. Can they deliver those to the Eagles playmakers? Because we know that Nick Foles isn't going to get the job done by himself. He's going to need his playmaker, his playmakers around him. And I love the speed and the physical of the Atlanta defense, how they arrive violently. I think this is another upset win for the Falcons. It's a good point J.J. makes, too, there, about the about the being battle-tested, having to go through the NFC South. It seems like that served both the Panthers and Saints well last week. The Panthers coming back in that game and really challenging the Saints. And it seems like it served the Falcons well, too. I talked to Matt Ryan about this a couple weeks ago, and he just said, this team has grit. This team's grittier than the team last year. Maybe not as high flying and not as spectacular as the 2016 Falcons, but they've been in some of those tough spots. They've had to fight out of a lot of tough spots over the course of the year, and that seems to be paying off now. The fact that they've had to go through that and kind of pull themselves up, 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 up off the canvas a few times. It seems like there's been a benefit there. Well, the opening line in Vegas does have the Falcons favored on the road at the number one seed, so that'll be a fun one to watch. Jonathan, let's go to the Saturday evening matchup. We've got the Titans at the Patriots. Patriots more than a two-touchdown favorite, but the Titans looked pretty good for about 10 minutes over the weekend. Marcus Mariota kind of looking like his old self out there like he did at Oregon. What do you think about this one? Yeah, I think Vegas probably has this one right. In fact, Vegas may be conservative uh, with this line. You know, this is very similar, I think, to last year's divisional round game uh, that the Patriots had. We, we just, we've had them really sharpied into the AFC title game for some time. And I know that we have to offer some type of analysis about this game. <laughs> the Titans, 
the Titans got lucky against the Chiefs. The Chiefs were a better team. Um, you know, they, they outsmarted themselves with play calling. They've admitted as much in the days since then. Uh, Marcus Mariota completing a pass to Marcus Mariota for a touchdown. You know, it was a it was a fluky win. They need a healthy DeMarco Murray. They, they need everything to break right, the Tennessee Titans do, for them to get the win. Congratulations to them for getting into the playoffs and for getting that win. That's going to go a long way for the franchise, even if maybe it's not the best thing long-term for Marcus Mariota when you look at Mike Malarkey's uh, long-term um, coaching security. That said, good for the franchise for getting the win, but I don't think anyone in their right mind is picking anything uh, close to a Titans upset. And, and one thing to remember, too, the Chiefs did lose Travis Kelsey in the first half of that game. And that's when everything seemed to change for the Chiefs. The Titans really struggled to cover Travis Kelsey. And the Patriots are bringing an even better tight end to the table in Rob Gronkowski. And so that's going to cause issues. The other thing to watch here, too, the Titans haven't exactly been off the charts defensively over the course of the year, right? Yeah. Dick LeBeau is the defensive coordinator. Dick LeBeau runs the Pittsburgh system. Tom Brady has had enormous success against the Steelers, both in the regular season and the postseason over the course of the career. This is the type of defense that Tom Brady eats up. And there may be a little bit extra motivation there, too, with everything that they've been through the last couple of weeks. Generally, those sorts of things happen. They're able to channel those in a really positive way. So I think that's something we got to watch for, too. Early on, it could be an angry team coming out of the gate in Foxborough. Well, one thing Marcus Mariota can do that maybe Tom Brady can't is both throw the ball and catch it himself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's move on to Sunday's AFC matchup. This, I think, is maybe the most intriguing to me, Jacksonville at the Steelers. This Jacksonville defense mm -hmm. looks like they could carry a team to the Super Bowl if – the offense isn't a liability there with Blake Bortles. And, of course, we saw them intercept Big Ben five times yeah. on the road at Pittsburgh earlier this year. Do you think that Jacksonville could pull the upset here? So much of this is going to boil down to how the Steelers' offensive line plays. And I know the sexy thing is to talk about Antonio Brown's health or how Le'Veon Bell is going to play against um, that defense. I think this really does boil down to their ability to handle all of those guys up front. When Jacksonville's been able to tee off and have these big turnover or big sack performances, it really comes down to all of those guys on the front. And so if the Steelers can control the Jaguars' defensive front, I don't see the Jaguars being able to score with the Steelers. If the Jaguars can really take the edge early on there, get on top of Big Ben, that's where you can see the, the, the Jaguars starting to force mistakes like they did back in October. Remember, in that game, the Jaguars' defense scored 14 points, which was more than the Steelers' offense scored. I think we might be in another one of these situations where the Jaguars' defense has to outscore the Steelers' offense for them to win because the Jaguars' offense didn't look very good last weekend. Yeah, certainly looking like a liability there, yeah. like I said. I wonder, though, if potentially the Jags are in uh, Big Ben's head. Jonathan, what do you think of this one? You know, I was in Jacksonville this past weekend, talked to a lot of guys, obviously. That 30-9 that win at Heinz Field, I think we were all looking at that early in the season. And, well, Pittsburgh's always due for one of those every year. And then they make that run. No worries at all. This Jaguars defense is absolutely for real. And, and as Albert talked about, of course, it starts up front with the guys that they have, the big defensive end and Calais Campbell, of course, what you have with Malik Jackson. You're able to get some things uh, with Telvin Smith and the, and the linebackers. And, of course, when you look at that secondary with uh, A.J. Bowie, with, uh, with Jalen Ramsey, of course, uh, Barry Church back there, Tashawn Gibson, things have really coalesced back there in the back end for this Jaguars defense. And so uh, it was, they picked them all five times uh, in the last game. I think Albert mentioned all the turnovers, 27 of the 30 points came off of uh, Pittsburgh turnovers. And so I'm in agreement. Uh, of course, the Jaguars defense is going to have to outscore the Patriot or the, the Pittsburgh Steelers offense because Blake Bortles is just not going to get it done. We all know this. It, I think a lot of people are going to try to talk about uh, the early 2000s Ravens and a Trent Dilfer. Blake Bortles is far worse than Trent <laughs> Dilfer. He is not a very good quarterback. He is not a, a top half quarterback. He just, as long as he doesn't turn the ball over, Jacksonville has a chance. But still, that's a very big ask. Let's go to the night matchup. We've got the Saints at the Vikings. I think these are two of the most complete teams in the NFL, a matchup I'm really excited about. Uh, we've got Drew Brees, the veteran quarterback. He's been here before. Case Keenum, a story we never expected. Jonathan, what do you like about this matchup? I love this matchup. I think it's the best matchup that we're going to see so far in the NFL playoffs. It may be the best one. Uh, throughout. I think the winner of this is going to win the NFC. Uh, and I don't think it's going to be close because this this really has been the best. These have been the best two teams in the, in the NFC 
all season long. When you look at what you have with Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram, and of course they were bottled up a little bit, at least more so than they were the previous two games against the Panthers, and Minnesota can certainly take from that. I think Minnesota's defense is better uh, than Carolina's. Very interested to see what you have in Case Keenum here in the playoffs. But you know what's kind of in my mind, especially after last night, the move that Nick Saban pulled, pulling uh, the quarterback that got him there for the freshman. Is it possible if Case yeah. Keenum's struggling in a, in a playoff appearance? Listen, you got a healthy Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, Sam Bradford may be able to go. W- would you make that change? Because, you know, like we talked about last week, Albert, uh, the Vikings have been yep. blessed to get this quarterback position right three times. I'll tell you what, it takes a little bit of that I don't give a bleep to, to do what Nick Saban did, right? Like, you just have to have a little bit of that something to do something like that as a coach. And I think Mike Zimmer does have that little something. So I wouldn't be totally shocked if they really, really struggled early on and defense was forced to carry the team if you did see Mike Zimmer do something to create a spark. What I love about the Saints team, and we've been talking about it for the last couple of months, this is probably, in my mind at least, the best combination of defense and running game that Drew Brees has had in his 12 years in New Orleans, and that's including the championship team. They've shown they can win even if Brees doesn't have his A game. And that was what was great about the Carolina game last weekend is the defense struggled a little bit against Cam Newton and company. The, as, J, as J.J. said, that the run game was shut down, and Drew Brees was nails when they needed him to be. And now instead of Drew Brees sort of being their whole hand, which is what has been too often in New Orleans, He's just their trump card. Mm. And they were able to pull that trump card last week in a playoff setting. I think that makes them very, very dangerous here. I think that they're a real threat, like J.J. said, to get to Minneapolis and win the whole thing. That's, that's my pick. I got to say yeah. it. Um, before we get you guys out of here, let's touch on the coaching carousel. Yep. We're seeing now as teams are eliminated, we're seeing coaches uh, going in for interviews and vacancies and all that. Jonathan, I want to get the latest from you on Steve Wilkes interviewing with the New York Giants. What are you hearing? Yeah, I believe that interview went well. Of course, he met with Dave Gettleman, a guy that he's very familiar with, having been the general manager here in Carolina throughout Wilkes' tenure here in Carolina. And so, but, you know, I was surprised. Honestly, I thought that this was going to be the perfect marriage, that New York wasn't going to let him out of the building. They were going to have dinner tonight. They were going to hold him hostage. And then that was going to be that. We've heard this time and again in coaching searches. But he up on that plane, and he's heading to Arizona where I think he could also fit there with a very young and exciting secondary. Obviously, that's Steve Wilkes' bread and butter. And so I would understand if Steve wants to hear out Arizona and what they have to say when you have the opportunity to coach guys like Patrick Peterson and the Honey Badgers. So I understand him getting on the flight. However, I was a little surprised, Albert backed me up on this, that uh, New York let him out of there. Yeah, you know what I think is interesting about it is like New York is, I think New York and Arizona are sort of in a different category than Indianapolis and Detroit where feels to me like Indianapolis and Detroit have real front runners now. New York and Arizona are a little bit more wide open. And so I, I think Wilkes is going to be an interesting candidate in all of these places just because, first of all, he was on everybody's radar when he was a position coach. A year later, he's got a year of experience as a coordinator. And, oh, by the way, the guy that he's succeeding, Sean McDermott, killed it in Buffalo this year. And so I think that that helps Wilkes too. I think there's genuine curiosity in a lot of these places about Wilkes it's just that sometimes you need a sponsor, you know, when you're on the when when, when you're when you're one of the candidates that's in play for a number of different jobs. Clearly, you know, Matt Patricia has a sponsor in Bob Quinn in Detroit. I think Josh McDaniels to some degree has a sponsor in Indianapolis and Chris Ballard. I think the Giants and the Cardinals jobs are a little bit wider open than the other two. That said, I do think that Wilkes's relationship with Dave Gettleman, having worked together all those years in Carolina, does help him in his effort to get the job. It's just that I think they're more committed to that being a real open process than maybe some of the other ones have been. Albert, Jonathan, thanks so much for joining us for all your insight today. We really appreciate it. Now, our brilliant friends at Pro Football Focus bring us a sleeper team that could make a Super Bowl run in our Well Actually of the Week. I'm Steve Palazzolo. And I'm Sam Monson. We are Pro Football Focus, and this is Well Actually. Sam, the first round of the NFL playoffs are out of the way, and the contenders are starting to take shape. With the top seeds now entering the fray, we're looking at the best teams in the league squaring off in the divisional round. While everybody's talking about the same few teams, Well Actually, the Falcons could be the team to run the table. Yeah, the Falcons are my upset pick of Wild Card Weekend, and they came out of Los Angeles with a win. And I really think that this team is equipped to make a sensational return to the Super Bowl that they lost in such heartbreaking fashion a year ago. 28-3. to 3. Harsh. 
This team is better than people are giving them credit for, and they've been better all season long than their record indicates. Last season, the number one and number two graded teams at PFF overall were the Atlanta Falcons and the New England Patriots, by a mile in the NFL, the two Super Bowl teams. The team that's led the PFF grading in four of the last five seasons has made the Super Bowl, and the team that's leading the PFF grading in 2017, the Atlanta Falcons. I'm with you, Sam. The numbers really do undersell this Falcons team. Just look at quarterback Matt Ryan. He's tied for number two in our PFF grades, but the box score numbers don't look good. They don't look nearly as good as last year, that's for sure. And it's because he's had terrible interception luck. He actually has the lowest percentage of turnover-worthy plays this year. Those are those passes that should be intercepted, the ones that we give the harsh downgrades for quarterbacks. He's been great at taking care of the ball, but he has 12 interceptions because of that terrible luck, whether it's miscommunications, dropped passes, and, of course, don't forget the butt pick by Marshawn Lattimore of the Saints, a dropped pass that lands on Lattimore's buttocks for an interception. That just sums up Matt Ryan's season. He's been excellent this year. He's been very efficient, and we saw it in the Rams game. He's very good at just picking up what you need in key third down situations, and he's been the best, most accurate intermediate thrower in the entire NFL this season. But I think it's the defense that's really begun to take a step forward and propel this team into this postseason run. Linebacker Deion Jones has become the best coverage linebacker in the game. His coverage grade is phenomenal. His coverage numbers are fantastic, about 30 points better than the average linebacker in terms of pass rating allowed when targeted. But even just their biggest games this season, it's been Deion Jones that's been coming up big at the most crucial times. Interception to seal the win against a hard-charging New Orleans Saints. Close coverage on Greg Olson against the Panthers to prevent any kind of comeback then. And then last week against the Rams, he was the guy in the end zone breaking up a pass intended for Sammy Watkins to kill any hopes the Rams had of that comeback. Deion Jones has become this fantastic player. We talk all the time about matchup problems on offense and guys that will give defenses trouble. Deion Jones is the rare matchup player on defense that will swing the balance back in their favor. Yeah, Jones has been absolutely fantastic. And let's not forget about that defensive line. You know, a year ago, we were talking about Vic Beasley, who led the league in sacks. But they weren't great across the board on that D-line. This year, though, they have seven guys that they're rotating in and out who can all get after the quarterback. Adrian Claiborne having a career year as a top 20 edge defender in our grading so far. Grady Jarrett, one of the most disruptive interior defensive linemen. And be, even beyond that, Brooks Reed off the edge. Dakaris McKinley as a rookie coming off the edge. They signed Dontari Poe this offseason. He's doing a good job of pushing the pocket. And, of course, they still do have Beasley. So we're talking about a team that is deeper up front, and they're actually pressuring the quarterback at a higher rate this year than they, than they did last year on the Super Bowl run. And that secondary has really begun to hit its full stride. Robert Alford is coming off his best game of the season against the Rams. Desmond Trufant is back there as a true number one corner that we always knew he could be, hitting his best form as well. That coverage really helps them out. That's right. The Falcons are looking good all around. The grades have liked them all season. The record has not always been indicative of how well they've played, but right now, maybe the most dangerous team remaining in the NFC. It's time for Scott Spotlight as we're joined by our friend, former NFL GM and executive Scott McLuhan. And Scott, we've got four divisional games on tap for the weekend, some potentially great matchups here. Which of these is the must-watch game of the week for you? I, I believe New Orleans at Minnesota. You know, you have uh, a first ball, ballot Hall of Famer in Drew Brees, um, who's had a good year and the, the offense has played well. And you're going to a hostile environment in Minnesota and their defense has played well all year. You know, I think this is one that's going to be a knockdown drag out. Um, I would never, I, I, I played against him many times, Drew Brees. You never count him out. I know it's tough on the road. The divisional, you know, playoffs are always exciting. But I got promise you this, with Coach Zimmer sitting there knowing Drew Brees is coming to town, they're nervous. But it's going to be a heck of a game. What's your prediction? I'm saying... I'm going with the first ballot Hall of Famer. I'm going Drew Brees. Close one, though. Close one. It's, 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 I don't think it's going to be high scoring whatsoever. I think it's going to be, like I said, when you get to this point in the playoffs, they're, they're there for a reason, and they're good teams on both sides of the ball and special teams. But that Drew Brees is something else. He just makes play after play. It's incredible. All right, well, Scott, obviously, while that's going on, the job market's heating up, and I – 
Couldn't help but notice you got a nice little shout out there in Green Bay uh, earlier this week. One of your guys, um, Brian Gutekunst, who worked under you in Green Bay as the new Packers general manager. Obviously, that's a coveted job. It's one that doesn't come open very often. So we wanted to ask you what you think Gutekunst brings to the table there. You know what? He's uh, He comes from a football family. His dad was a longtime college coach, long time. And I was already there when he came in, and Ron said, do me a favor. Can you take him on your wing um, and kind of teach him the ropes, you know, how we do things here? I'm like, yeah, not a problem. Um, he was young. Um, he started from nothing, not like I did, at the bottom, worked his way all the way to the top. Uh, really intelligent guy, a football guy through and through, um, and a, a dang good person. Um, we, we hung out many nights eating dinner, just, just talking football. Cause you know, like I said, his father's a long time coach and he was thinking about getting the coaching. And I said, well, that's fine. You do what you want to do. But he'd ask the, the perfect questions about scouting. What's, what's, you know, what, tell me how, how to do this. You know, tell me what, what to look for. Tell me how to write reports. Tell me, you know, who to talk to. Um, and he, like, like I said, he's, he's, he's done a great job since he's been in the league. You know, again, he's, he's, he's climbed the ladder. And he deserves it. He deserves a shot at it. Um, I, I feel nervous for him from the standpoint I've been in that situation, being a younger guy and being a first-time GM, because a lot of things come at you. But he's been around Mike McCarthy long enough. You know, he's been around, you know, Mark Murphy long enough to kind of understand the dynamics of the building. And he's been in the building the last couple of years. So, he'll, he, you know, with me, I just walked in a situation where I didn't know it at all in San Fran. And you got to learn the, the personalities. You got to learn the people that are in the building. You know, he has that already in place. So I'm pulling for him. And I told him I'd help him any manner I can, if that okay. helps at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you, you mentioned the dynamics in the building. Those are going to change now. While, while Ted was there, obviously, there's been a more traditional setup where the head coach reports to the GM who reports to the team president, Mark Murphy. And now they're restructuring a little bit where Mike McCarthy. Russ Ball, who's the new VP of football operations, and Gutekunst are all going to report directly to Murphy. That's a significant change structurally. Functionally, how do you think that's going to change who the Packers are? You know what? I think it's, I think it's positive. The, the thing about Ted, who's a really, really good friend of mine, he was always on the lockdown communication-wise. He didn't want to put much information to the president, to the head coach, whatever. Now, he'll talk to you and all that, but he's really secure with his information. And I think what Mark Murphy's looking for now is like a lot of organizations is everybody working together and talking together and figuring things out together. And again, I, I'm not taking a shot at Ted whatsoever, but that's just his personality. I've known him 20 some years and he's just, he's just quiet. He doesn't want to let people know what's really going on in his mind. Where now I think with Mark Murphy doing what he's doing, you know, even with McCarthy, you know, been there a long time, you know, Goody been there a long time, you know, it's just, Communication, and you have to have that. You have to have that with the free agency, with the draft, with the roster during the season, with transactions during the season. You have to be able to talk and just, you know, walk down the hallway and say, hey, you know, Coach McCarthy, I'm thinking about this, you know. And, not again, I'm not content, but that's not his style. He, no, he would just sit in his office, watch tape, and make decisions. All right, now it's time for our Symmetra Rising Star of the Week. Scott, you nailed it last week with Derrick Henry. He went off for Tennessee. Who's an under-the-radar player who could be the X factor in this weekend's division round matchups? Okay, it's, it's a tough one because we're getting down to the nitty-gritty. I'm saying Brandon Cooks at New England. Um, I, I think, you know, I think with Tom, he's going to come out throwing. I think they want to prove a point with what's gone on in the last week and a half, two weeks about the organization. They're going to come out and prove a point and let everybody know they're on the same page. And I think Brandon's a really good player. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if he goes off, and, and he should because he's that talented. But I think there's, there's something in my gut that tells me that he's going he's gonna to ball big time. And, I, and Tom, Tom wants to prove you know, to everybody, listen, we're, 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 we're solidified. We're together. We're the, we're, there's a reason why we're favorites to win the Super Bowl. Scott, what is it about Cooks and his game in the Patriots offense that you like against this Dick LeBeau defense? I like the fact that he can play inside and outside. He's more of an inside guy, but he can't play outside. I like the big playability. I like the speed. I like the quickness. And the guy, every, every time you watch him, he, he, he'll he make a big play. You know, in college, he was lights out. And that's why he went where he went in draft. And since he's been there, and I just, he, he's, he, he's a tough matchup because of the quickness and speed. Because he's not a big guy. He's a thicker guy, but not a tall guy. But he catches it. He can score from everywhere on the field. 
and that's going to be huge in, in this matchup. Scott, always great to get your thoughts. Thanks for making me smarter today. Hey, just one second. I got wild card for the player of the week this week. Okay. Nick Foles. You wait and see. <laughs> Why All Nick right. Foles? There we go. He really did not look good in his last game. Last two games. Last yes. two games. You give him two weeks and with, with Doug Peterson, and, and he's got talent around him, and they're playing at home. You wait and see. That's, that's, that's my wild card. Now, I could, I could be completely off base, but look out. There we go. All right, we'll Come talk on. to you about it next week, see how you did. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks, Scott. I'm Albert Breer. This is Last Call. Now, earlier in the year, I told you about the NFL's offensive line crisis and how it would play a role in how the 2017 season would play out. And here we are at the end of the year, and the quarterback crew set to star in divisional weekend is hit or miss. But the teams that have invested in the fat guys up front are still alive. Seven of the eight teams still kicking are among pro football focus's top 13 pass blocking groups, and each made a commitment to get there. The Eagles have a top five pick at right tackle, paid their center and left tackle, who's now hurt, and found a big ticket guard in free agency. The Saints have two first round picks on their line, a highly paid left tackle on top of that, and a center who is part of the Jimmy Graham trade. The Vikings spent big at both tackle spots last offseason to fix what was an issue in 2016. And while the Falcons have had their issues, their left tackle was a top 10 pick and their center a high priced free agent. It's the same story in the AFC. The Steelers invested first rounders in a center and a guard. The Titans have first rounders at both tackle spots. The Jaguars spent the 34th pick on a tackle last spring, and that guy wound up replacing the left tackle they traded for, and then they paid their center. All that brings us back to the one team that wasn't that high in the PFF rankings, the Patriots. They happen to have the best coach of all time and the best quarterback of all time, and when they had line issues a couple years ago, they brought back Dante Scarnecchia, who's been an absolute ninja of a line coach. Even still, the Patriots have a former first-rounder at left tackle, paid their now-injured right tackle twice, and they've spent nine draft picks on offensive linemen over the last four years. So what all of this tells you is that even in an era when practice rules and changing trends at the college level are killing the pipeline, smart teams are keeping at it and finding ways to make it work up front. Moving Brandon Cooks for what amounted to Ryan Ramchick wasn't a popular move in New Orleans in the spring, but that one worked out okay, as did Minnesota's moves to sign Riley Reef and Mike Remmers, and the Titans maneuvering to wind up with Jack Conklin as GM John Robinson's first draft pick in 2016, even when Taylor Luan was already on hand. Robinson playing his first draft that way wasn't unlike how Chip Kelly handled his first one in Philly. After taking Lane Johnson with the fourth overall pick, Chip made it simple, saying, big people beat up little people. Chip's now gone, but if this weekend's cast is any indication, those are words for NFL teams to live by. Hmm.